Good morning. Sorry, buddy. A minute or two late. Sorry about that. It's okay. We're on the record case number 12 CF 1083A, State versus George Zimmerman. issue of the animation. We had a deposition last night that I think focused the inquiry a bit. I know that the state still has some concerns that they need to address. I don't think it's as much like we talked about yesterday as an admissibility problem itself as to the underlying science, but a question of the applicability to the facts. Actually, based upon the testimony, I have supplemented the original motion again this morning, and I now do believe that there is both concerns, both the Daubert sort of admissibility issue, as well as the earlier concerns, most of them that I had originally outlined. The, the reason is this. The gist, and I do have a copy for the court of the deposition from last night. I got an electronic copy mailed to me. This is part three of the witness's deposition. And essentially what we have now done from the state's perspective is we have moved from the witness initially creating the exhibit that he said represented essentially the, the physical evidence as well as things he gathered from police reports and witness statements. Now what changed since the last portion of the deposition, which is what resulted in the production of the animation I received yesterday, is that we have now taken the animation and attempted to fit it to the theory of an expert who has yet to actually testify about it. Um, so we have now gone from, and, and that's the reason that the state now believes that there is now a Daubert issue, because we have now moved from simple representation as to physical items to now attempting to create a, essentially a, a animated, I don't know if you want to call it a cartoon, but an animated depiction of the theory that the, uh, that Dr. DeMaio discussed with this witness on the phone on Saturday after Mr. Shoemaker had been deposed twice, but right before Dr. DeMaio's deposition. Um, at least that's according to the timing that Mr. Shoemaker told us last night. So because of that, because of what came out in that deposition that I'm glad the court authorized last night, I do now think that we need to expand this hearing to include Daubert materials. And I do have some, some cases that point that out why, but whether we call it a Daubert or Fry hearing, a combination Daubert, Fry, Pierce hearing, I think that all those issues now need to get fleshed out based upon the reasons for this change and what they represent. And I filed a, a supplemental motion this morning accordingly. I would also point out, during last night's deposition, the witness indicated that he had prepared additional still depictions and also it showed, showed me or displayed a, com a computer diagram um, indicated I was going to be getting copies of that. I got the court reporter's promised transcript, but I have gotten nothing yet from the witness. So I still don't have those physical things to hand to the court to show you. But that is the reason for the supplemental motion. And I apologize for now telling the court that we do want what I thought I hoped wasn't necessary yesterday. But given what was said last night, I believe it is.
Okay, defense response. The um, a factual response first, I guess, is probably appropriate, and that is that the um, the concern evidenced by the state through various paragraphs in the supplemental motion basically addressed the one fact issue that is in fact undisputed, and that is that Dr. Shipping Bow and our expert as to um, the medical examiner, the pathologist, is that the gun shot entered Mr. Martin at approximately a 90 degree angle from the plane of the chest and somewhere close to a um, straight through shot. There, there is a little bit of angling as it enters the body off dead center line, but there's no dispute um, as to that underlying fact. It is that underlying fact that led to what I believe to be, if I understand the motion, the state's concern. And that is that Mr. Shoemaker, who was, had attended to the making of the animations for the last several weeks, all of which up to the last couple of days the state has been well aware of, deposed and given copies of, um, in consultation with Dr. DeMaio, um, added to that fact the potential of the distance from the gun to the body. Testified in part by Dr. Bao in that he said the only distance he would give is somewhere between 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 inches and 4 feet. The anticipated testimony of Dr. DeMaio, as was referenced in his um, sworn testimony, is that it's somewhere between 2 and 4 inches. So we had prepared an exhibit to document that. Because of the lateness of concern and the state's concern over that, I'm very fine with not using that still. It's not part of the animation, but that still. I think I can probably use it in, in closing as a demonstrative tool. I don't think that's necessary for the court's consideration as far as evidence. So that's withdrawn. And I mentioned that to the state a moment ago. It's why I stood up at the bench when he was talking, um, just to make sure that that was clear, because it was just discussed last night. That leaves the underlying fact that the state seems to suggest is a concern, and that is the positioning of the bodies when the shot was fired. We know the relative positioning of the gun and the body at 90 degrees. So then what's not known and what is depicted in the animation as the probable positioning of the bodies based upon John Good's testimony is what I guess is an issue. And that is that if you keep the body and the gun together, 
maybe two or four inches, but for purposes of me talking to you, let's just put it up against. But certainly, if Mr. Martin was like this, or like this, or even maybe the state could argue like this, although John Good has it about like this because he has him mounted over him and leaning over him. That is what we had used, John Good's specific testimony and the only eyewitness testimony as to the relative positions when he saw it. Now, I'll tell you, the state's going to say, well, he didn't see the gunshot. He left a few seconds before, so there could have been movement. And I think that goes to something the state can argue to the jury, they can even have decided to come up with their own animation with something different or their own expert to suggest something different. They haven't, but they could have. Um, so I think that it's reasonable for us, based upon the evidence, particularly John Good's testimony, and Shipping Bow's testimony and the anticipated testimony of Dr. DeMaio, that we have an animation that has the bodies <coughs> in that position. They can certainly suggest what they want to, but I don't believe, and I've never seen, that evidence admissibility is dependent upon it not having some argument to the jury that it may have happened differently. Every witness who came in and gave testimony, whether it be Mr. Shoemaker, Dr. DeMaio, Dr. Bao, or anybody else, is up for impeachment before the jury. So I don't understand now why that makes it a Fry or Daubert uh, admissibility concern when we know that animations are very ad very admissible and often used more in civil cases, but criminal, but also in criminal cases. Pierce was a criminal case. And as long as it does, based upon facts, adduce the trial, which this is, um, and can assist the trial fact, which I think it can, and not to mention the fact that it is, is specifically in line with the facts of the evidence and supports our theory of the defense as to how things happened and there's nothing to contest it. I don't believe if we were to go through a Dalbert, Pierce, Fry standard, it would meet admissibility, so maybe we need to do that now. But the underlying facts are supported by the evidence, so I'm not certain. While I, say, I see the state is saying they talked, but they didn't talk and come up with anything different than John Good testified to. So I, I, I'm not certain what their true objection is to the admissibility of it, um, because what they're saying is now it's just based upon what we talked about, well, no, it's based upon the 90-degree angle. And that's the one underlying undisputed fact that is the premise for the positioning of the parties. Now, as to the entirety of the animation, since I guess we're talking about all of it, what you'll see, and you really need to take a look at it, so we'll present it to you in a moment, what you'll see is it is more than an animation, it's more like a series of stills because in response to states' concerns in the past, we took out animation and replaced it with a still. For example, there was a movement of the arms in one shot, and we, there was eight, or there were 10, or there were four, or there were 30. Uh, sorry to That's okay. interrupt you, but if we were just to start with the hearing, and then you can give sure. the argument um, after the hearing. So the defense has the burden. Um, so call your first witness. Call um, Daniel Shoemaker. We'll take a moment to get his hardware set up so we can show it to you. Okay, thank you. Do you solemnly swear from the testimony presented will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. Now I can give my question to the solemnly Yes, you may. State your name, sir. Daniel Shoemaker. And your business address? Um, 1630 North Main Street, Walnut Creek, California, 94596. And the name of your company? Contrast Forensics. And what type of business is that? Um, crime scene accident reconstruction. 
I take uh, a lot of different information. I take uh, coroner's reports, uh, accident, crime scene reports, um, photographs from the scene. I take my own measurements and my own photos, total station data, which is a survey of the scene. I take all that information and put it into context in the reconstruction of a crime scene. Okay, let's back up um, a little bit and talk about um, how you got into this business to start. Um, initially, it started from doing information uh, graphics for Fortune 500 companies. And uh, tell me the time when that began? Uh, it was 26 years ago. Okay, and who did you work for and what did you do? Um, I worked for Viewcom Systems in uh, Independence, Ohio, and it was, uh, we did corporate presentations and information graphics for uh, all the tire companies in Akron. They also had an office up in Troy, Michigan, and we did all the um, information graphics for the car companies up there. I'm presuming this is in the days even before PowerPoint, right? It was days before desktop computers a lot, okay. mostly. So back then we're talking about a, a lot of uh, art graphic work and just poster presentation, is that correct? Uh, we had a sophisticated computer, it was called uh, Imaginator, and it did slides. And um, how long were you with that company? I was with the company for about five years. And what was your position with the company? Uh, senior artist. So in, in effect then you would take on a project, create the graphics and the presentation tools in order to present that to an audience? Yes, and work with the client on any modifications and um, all the information that went into it. Did you have any formal education in this area before you began working for that company? I have a Bachelor in Fine Arts. If you would just tell the court what the focus of that was and how that assisted you in beginning your career in, in this type of work. Um, that ran the gamut for uh, advertising and marketing and uh, corporate identity covered all those bases. And you focused your career then on sort of at that point the graphic presentation of ideas to audiences? Yes, the best way to communicate to an audience. Um, various ideas and uh, procedures. And that was done for approximately five years? Yes. And then where did you go from there? I uh, went from there to California. I did basically the same thing in California for uh, a lot of the companies in the Bay Area. And... Is that sort of on a contract basis or were you working for a particular company? Worked for a company. I was a senior artist there. And what company was that? Um, Dolphin Multimedia. Uh, similar job description that you would sort of take on a project and figure out how to best present it? Similar job as in Ohio, but being in the Bay Area, um, you had a lot more access to um, more up-to-date software, um, more up-to-date technology in that area. Being close to Simi Valley helps, I guess? Yes. Okay. And um, tell the court, was there any difference in what you'd done for the first five years to what you had done now when you're with in California doing this type of work? Uh, the main difference between then and now is um, doing a lot of information graphics for uh, proposals, large government proposals. So I do two types of work. I do uh, information graphics for uh, government proposals, and then also um, I do the information graphics and crime scene reconstruction for attorneys. And um, going forward then, from how long were you doing this type of work in California? Is that what you're still doing today? That's what I'm still doing today. So how long have you been doing this type of work in California? It's been in the last about 13 years. And. Um, have you been doing that under contrast forensics or has the name of your company or consulting group changed at all? It's gone from contrast design to contrast forensics. What is your role with the company? Um, owner, sole proprietor. You're it? I'm it. Okay. 
And uh, over the past 13 years, if you explain to the court the type of work that you focused on, particularly in the area of, as you said, the courtroom work or the forensic side of it. It initially started out by uh, working with attorneys on designing their information on how best to communicate to the jury. Uh, corporate presentations were at a certain level and courtroom presentations were a bit below that. Um, so I worked on, um, worked with attorneys on that. It's gone from uh, information graphics for attorneys like that to drawing crime scenes and the sophisticated sophistication of the work in the crime scene has progressed quite a lot. Um, to the point with the equipment that I have that I'm using now. Okay. So if you would bring bring us along a little bit as to the progression, how it happened, what type of software or hardware was available to you 13 years ago when you started, and then sort of if you could progress us up through what you utilize today. Back then it was most, mostly just uh, drawing out a scene. You go out and measure the crime scene and then you draw it out on the computer to scale and accurate. And it was mostly 2D. Um, from then it's gone more into 3D to the point where uh, 3D reconstruction and also uh, sophisticated, the software has gotten a lot more sophisticated with uh, accident and crime scene reconstruction software. Back 13 years ago then did it sort of start with you going out to a scene with a the tape roller where you would go from one point to the other and get a measurement or how yes. was it back then? It was just hand measuring like that with a tape, metal tape roller. And um, without going through everything in between, what type of um, software and hardware is available to you and do you use in your business today? Uh, the software that I use, um, I have two kinds for uh, using my uh, total station data. Uh, I use software called Aris 360. That's on the cutting edge of taking total station. Aris 360. A R A S. Thank you. And it's just the number 360. Um, that's what. That's I what. Sure, I, I want to make sure that we sort of start with a foundation point. So when you, even when you say something like total station, which may be something that you're very used to in your environment, if you would bring us back a little bit, not to grade school, but just to an idea of when you walk onto a scene or when you come on to a project, what information do you look for to see if it's existing? And if not, what information do you then try to create in order to assist you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. It's progressed from using the tape measure to now I use a robotic laser. It's, the, it's a robotic surveying laser. You set it up on a tripod. Um, and you measure the crime scene and it'll create a series of points in 3D space. That's the total station used now by a lot of law enforcement, is that correct? Law enforcement and um, construction uh, road crews use that type of... In, in effect, what that does is if I had set up that laser mounted camera right here, it would bounce hundreds or thousands of points off every area in this courtroom and then it would have a data configuration of the entire outline laying, outlying area of the courtroom? Um, there's two types. That one does point cloud that you're talking about. The time, type that I have is just point by point. I normally lay out, uh, depending on the size of the scene, two to five hundred points in a scene. So the laser, um, I walk around with a um, pocket computer and a prism and everywhere I go and hit a um, hit the computer, it'll give me a point where I am. So the, the laser follows me around. So it only takes one person to operate. So it'll create kind of a point cloud <laughs> of the whole scene. So if I did the courtroom here, I put it in the computer in Aris 360 and it'll give me a 3D um, view of those points so that I can move around the scene anywhere I want. How does that compare to uh, the Total Station software? It's the same. Um, how does what compare well, to? Is there any difference between that and Total Station or are we talking about a different name for the same 
um, software? Uh, Total Station gathers the data, and then you export that data to Ares 360. So the Total Station, when we talk about that, that's just actually the getting the information, for example, from this courtroom. Yes. So gathering the information, and then the way you use it is in another software like Ares 360. It's a data collector, yes. And um, so again, once you get that information, you would go through just generally what you do when you come upon a project to either see that information is there and utilize it or to gather your own. Yes, I'll look at the data and examine it, make sure it's correct. Um, there's another piece of software besides Airs 360 that I have. It's um, called Visual Statement. And between those two, the uh, majority of Airs 360 and the majority of um, the other software are CHP and law enforcement. So, CHP being? Oh, California Highway Patrol. Yeah, just, we're in FHP, so, okay. And um, so within the context of the ARIS 360 and gathering, if you will, the environment digitally, um, how, how do you then make that relevant to a presentation? How do you put people, things, events, pieces of evidence in context to what you've now gathered? Um, it creates the scene to scale, and then what you do with that is you combine it with other, um, other pieces of equipment. Like I have a, um, I've got a motion capture suit for gathering, um, it's the most accurate way of gathering a person's movements. It's wireless, it has accelerometers, and you put on the suit, and in real time you can capture a person's movements. So then I capture a person's movements accurately, and then I can bring those into the scene, and so you have the accurate movements of the person, you have the accuracy of the scene, and um, you can do it. Very... If you were to give the court a couple of examples when you talk about the motion caption, capture suits, is that what they're called? Yes. Okay. If you would, give the court some examples of how you've utilized that technology um, in other cases. Um, you can not only you can use it a couple different ways. I use it for um, well about a month ago there was a um, I had to go down to the impound lot in San Jose and there was a shooting that occurred in a vehicle. The advantage of my suit over other suits is um, I can take it out to a crime scene. I can um, get into a vehicle and it still sees all of the movements. A typical motion capture suit that a lot of people see on TV has little balls all around it. And then there's high speed cameras that will capture your movements. Uh, the problem with that is you can't take it anywhere outside of those cameras. And if you get into a vehicle or behind a wall, uh, those parts of the person disappear because it can't see the balls anymore. So that's why I bought my suit is I can take it, it has accelerometers that measure your movements, there's 16 of them. Can so you the court just a little bit more the technology of what that is when you talk about an accelerometer and how that's better than just the visual balls that are seen on a suit? Um, it's perfect for court because then you can, um, it gives you a running uh, log of all the movements. Say for example, um, somebody hit something and caused a certain amount of damage. With this suit, I could do that same action and from the accelerometers you could see how much force it took, took to cause that amount of damage. Well, so, To the extent that you can then advise the court what is the, what software exists behind those suits or that interprets the movements of the suits that make that information relevant to your presentation? Um, it's just software that came with the suit. I, I don't know the physics behind it, but the engineers that have developed it, um, they not only use it for um, motion capture like this, but they also, it's used in biometrics for uh, physical rehabilitation and physical therapy and it monitors the person's movement from day to day. 
so then they can see if there's any improvement. Um, so in effect, I could put on one of those suits if I had a range of motion problem, put on the suit, do some physical therapy, get to here, do more physical therapy, get higher, and the suits actually can measure progress? Yes, you can see a printout of um, all the movements of the suit. Um, and do, do these, does the software that interprets the movement of the suits also then have um, criteria that can be put into the software to identify things, as you mentioned, like force or speed of movement and the effect that objects have moving through space? Yes, if you want to accomplish that in your um, reconstruction. So if you can then go back to the example of the car and, and sort of walk the court through how this suit gives uh, data which is then useful for recreation. Um, with the truck, uh, I put on the suit. Um, it was also, it was still considered a crime scene so they didn't want it uh, disrupted. So you're able to put on a TVEC suit which is a protective suit so you don't contaminate the scene. So I put on the TVEC suit, got into the truck, and um, what happened in that case was somebody uh, opened the door, tried to pull the person out, and in response to him being uh, the attempt of pulling him out, he reached for a gun and shot him. Shot so the person trying to come into the car? Yes. Okay. So it was a very good use of the suit. Putting it on, I had a, um, an attorney open the door, tried to pull me out, and I was able to record it all in real time. Let's talk about the, um, well, let, let's continue with that and, and advise the court, if you would, then what you were able to recreate, what data you used to recreate those movements, firstly, and then we'll talk about possible changes to the movements later. So what were you able to do in that case as far as recreating it and what data did you use or information did you use to recreate? In the truck? Yes, in the car case. Um, I had actu accurate measurements of the truck, so I had it uh, recreated the truck. And since I had the motion capture suit on interacting with the truck, my movements um, fit well within the truck. So then I take my movements it exports a BVH file, which is a motion file. And then I bring that into a 3D program that I also have uh, the truck in. And then I can just place that person. What, what you do is you map that person's movements onto a figure that matches the person that was involved. You uh, map it onto the person's skeleton. So then his movements are all accurate. The size of the person is accurate. Let me interrupt and ask you, how do you get the size of the person to be accurate? From police reports or uh, coroner's reports. Or so you would use height and weight, and does the software, or a function of the software, is to take that data and put it into the software and it recreates a body in proper proportion to height and weight and whatnot? Um, it doesn't do any simulation like recreating like that. Um, I just create, I just have a figure that I uh, size to the size that I need. And when I bring in the motion capture file, you can specify what height the person is. And in, can in you the specify their weight, for example? Um, weight is more uh, the appearance from photos. Um, would it be helpful for you to, and do you have the animation available of the car recreation? Um, I've got another sample. Then we'll go on to another one. Um, if you don't have the car one with you. This, this is just a simple one that happened in a um, Sam's Club parking lot. Okay. And I think um, it's um, shutting down, so we might need a moment, Your Honor. Okay. Yeah.
We have that one screen now, but not that one. So I may need some help from the clerk just to do an input change. with it self identifying the source. It's on the screen on here. Just went off. Just went off the screen. I think um, since it's just the court, maybe if we could somehow approach the bench, you could see it off of his computer screen. I think that would probably satisfy the need for me to show a video unrelated to this. Fine, you may bring it up here. Council will approach. You would advise the court to hear us. Maybe you can hear us. Yes, Thanks. Advise the court what it is um, that you're about to show. This, this is a sample of a motion file applied to a figure in the computer and dropped into the scene. And very quickly, how is this scene recreated so that it actually shows the environment that is the background for the event? Uh, this was all created in 3D software. And where the information come from? Uh, there was a security camera. It was very bad resolution, so I went out, and measured the scene, and uh, placed the vehicles where they were on the in the video. And this is just a better representation of what they couldn't see in the security video. And in order to come up with those graphics, when you say you went out, and measured the scene, and is that the information you then put into one of the graphics programs you mentioned earlier? Yes. And um, then. We're about to see the actual animation. So, how does the information concerning the movement of the animation get placed into the environment? I just imported from uh, just imported from the motion capture software. Okay. And what? And again, that's just something that you take the one environment that you created, and then when you put the action into it, how does it get placed in the right location? And how does that occur? Uh, I can move the figures around according to where they were placed in the scene. I can move around, rotate them, and place them in the scene. Okay, so that's a manipulation that you can do based upon either advice of counsel, um, evidence in a courtroom, or even come up with alternatives as to how an event may occur, correct? Yes, it doesn't change their movement. I can just change their location in the scene. Okay, go ahead and play those for the court then, if you would. So I actually used a shopping cart to position my hands correctly. So is that, is that then a, a graphic representation of information that you took from evidence, or witness statements, whatever, and then made a graphic representation of it on the screen? Yes. And um, when you say that the movement of the person um, how do you decide how the movement is, both the speed, the direction, and how does all that occur? It was time from the security camera. Okay, as far as that, nothing further. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Now that we've had a chance to look at that, um, 
animation, was there anything, before we get specifically to the Germany case, but to ask this, was there anything different in the software or the hardware that you used in that representation than the one that you've used in the Zimmerman case? Um, the Zimmerman case, there was more total station data. It wasn't data that I acquired, it was data that was provided. Um, from the DA's office. Okay, before we get to your specific work on this case, um, tell me, are there any um, coursework or training programs that you go through um, to either enhance your abilities to do this type of work or to maintain your level of confidence? Um, both in the Eric's 360 software, I've gone through classes in that and it's been, been trained in that. Um, I've been through three it's only required to be to go to go through one, but I've gone through three uh, total station data classes and been certified in using those in both Aris 360 software and um, visual statement software. Let's talk about the total station for a moment. That's the, the software program you said that law enforcement uses. The total station is the piece of equipment. It's a Sokia robotic total station. And actually, you know, in the Zimmerman case, that there was total station information available having been gathered by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, correct? Correct. In addition to um, those certifications that you mentioned, well, these total station certifications, who actually does the training for that? The software companies train them. Who own or license out the software? Yes. <clears throat> And what was the most recent time that you've taken any training regarding total station? Um, training in those courses for certification, I think it's um, it's been a couple of years. It's on my CV. I can't remember the exact date. But also in uh, the Air 360 software, um, I continually update my skills in that. They have a webinar every Friday that I that I watch. So on Total Station, um, have there been any significant changes in the software since your certification or is it still basically the same program? The same. They come up with up, uh, the software comes up with, with upgrades every six months or so. And how about uh, the ARIS 360 program? Do you uh, take training courses on that? And you mentioned the webinars every Friday. Yeah, I've gone through uh, training and certification on um, using that software. Not only using the software, but using it with Total Station. And how long have you used the RS 360 software? Uh, when it first came out, I believe it's uh, two years ago in September, I think is when it came, first came out. Do you have the current version of that software? Yes. And up to date on your training with the current version? Yes. Any other software programs that you utilize um, in your general work in creating computer graphics and animations? The 3D software that I use is uh, it's Luxology, use Moto. I'm sorry, say that again, it's slower for the court reporter. The company is called Luxology, and the software is Moto. M O D O? Yes. And it's Luxology? Luxology, L U X. And Explain to the court then what that 3D software is and how it differs from the other two we've mentioned so far. It's for creating 3D scenes. Um, they use it for animation movies, uh, uh, animated movies. Does that then give you or allow you to present the, the environment we talked about or the framework within which the animation is going to be created? Yes, it's an environment where you can take all the data and bring it into it. and. Uh, create the scene in So if you were to create an animation of this area, would you then do the dimensions, get the environment, and then start putting in elements like the desks and the credenzas and the clerk's desk, things like that? Yes. And how do you get those accurate? Uh, the measurements from the total station data. So that the total station would be used in conjunction. It would bounce points off the various relative point or relevant points here and then sort of import it into the software, into the program? Yes. 
And then also, uh, one part of the AIRS 360 software is, um, I have a helicopter. I haven't used it in this case. It's a, uh, just a drone. And you fly to, I fly it above the scene. I can take a photograph of the scene. And then with that photo, I have the data points from the total station of the scene. I take the photo and it'll lay it on, it'll drape it right onto those points. So you get a very accurate outdoor reconstruction of a scene. So in effect, you can get more of a bird's eye view of the situation and also make certain that the ground level scene is accurate based upon a comparison with those data points? Yes. Have you had an opportunity then to create these type of animations and discuss them in the context of civil and or criminal cases? Yes. And if you would give the court an idea over what period of time you've done that, and then we'll talk more specifically about the type cases and whether or not you've testified in court. Um, it's been an ongoing for the last 13 years of doing it for criminal and civil cases. What was the first time that you created and presented an animation um, in a court case? Not necessarily in a courtroom yet, but into a court case. Um, Two thousand nine. If you would then uh, tell the court, uh, have you ever then gotten to the point where your animations have been utilized in a courtroom? Yes. And tell the court um, the experience that you've had in both civil and criminal settings regarding your testimony and admissibility of the animations. Well, also the. I use the motion capture suit not only for doing animations, but also to verify a person's position. I, uh, I did one a couple months ago where uh, a person was also in a vehicle. Uh, somebody came up, shot through the window, and then shot a couple more times. And uh, I had to determine which shots were done with him in the car and which shots were done because the car door was open and then he fell down. So I had to verify his position when those three shots were fired. So in that animation, it explains to the court how the, is there a name for this motion suit? This it's a XN, XSEN. XSEN? Yes, XN's uh, initial motion capture suit. And um, you used that in the shooting case, explain to the court how it benefited you and in the presentation of the animation. Um, what I did was I put on the suit, got into a vehicle that matched uh, the vehicle that was used, and recorded my movements of getting out of the vehicle. And then uh, I put it in the computer, and then in the, uh, the figure that matched uh, the victim, I put in the uh, rod to match the bullet trajectory and then looked at his positions getting out of the car to see uh, what positions the bullet trajectory, trajectory would be and if it was consistent with the height and the position of the shooter. Now let's talk about that um, in a little bit more context. So when you get in the car, you have the motion suit on. The, and it's communicating with a computer, correct? Correct. And the, the computer knows exactly where the body is in that it knows exactly where all 16 accelerometers are, correct? Yes. You calibrate it at the beginning of your uh, recording. You calibrate it for accuracy? Yes. And um, so at that point, you're doing movement, but the computer is actually gathering data on 16 discrete points in space that are moving throughout space, is that yes. correct? Um, the computer at that point may not know it's a body, it just is keeping track of 16 data points. Would that be accurate? Uh, well, in real time on the laptop, you can see a mannequin. Okay. So if I move my arms up, the mannequin will follow all of my movements. Okay. Um, explain to the court how you handle the frailty of an animation because it is not the exact video of, in this case, the driver moving his arms 
one particular way, but rather you deciding how the arms ought to be moved and how the body moves. So how do you address that frailty of the animation? You look at certain things that you know from the discovery, like the bullet trajectory, uh, the opening of the door, and also the physical characteristics of the inside of the truck. And uh, you look at different scenarios to find which one best matches the, uh, the scene and the evidence and discovery that you have. So in effect, do what you do is uh, do an animation that at the point you create it is consistent with the known information about the do you then make your animation in consideration of the evidence known to you at the time? Yes. And if that information is modified or augmented by additional information, do you then modify your animation to come into conformity with that? Yes, whatever is most accurate. At the point in time then when you don the suit, like you mentioned a moment ago that the software allows you to change the configuration of the body for things like height? Yes. Um, and then you, how do you then do a um, analysis of a person's physical size, not just height, but if the person is particularly thin, particularly obese, uh, how does that, how do you look at that and what do you input into the program to accomplish that? Um, most of that is done through uh, photographs that you have from coroner's reports or police reports, photographs. So do you then take measurements of those photographs, for example, um, do the ratio comparisons and then put that ratio comparison onto the mannequin, as you say, to uh, make it as close as possible to the live event? Yes, the measurements that you can get from a coroner's report or a police report or, it, uh, or even any measurements that you can take. And you also look at photographs? Yes. There's a thing you can do which is uh, I do not only on that but other in say for example uh, police took pictures of a scene. Uh, one of the things that's challenging with what I do is I come in after the fact so I have to rely on police photographs that were taken at the scene so a lot of times you don't have certain measurements for things but you have you may have one measurement for an item in a photograph so if you have one measurement of an item in a photograph with photogrammetry you can extrapolate the measurements of other items and that's Photograph. Just to speak very quickly, what you just said by photogrammetry, what is that and how does that assist you in coming up with measurements? It's, uh, if you have one known object that you know the measurement of, uh, with software you can extrapolate the measurements of other items in the scene. For example, if I'm standing here and you know how tall this is, and you might know how tall this camera is, that, that would assist you in telling you how tall I am? Yes, and other items, like I can tell how far away from the wall that you are by the position of your feet relative to the height of the wall. And that's what gives you the photogrammetric distance perspective, right? So if I was this much further away, you were looking at it, it might be different than if I was this close. Yes, you lay down a plane in the software, you lay down a plane, and if you um, no one measurement, you apply that measurement to the grid, to the plane, and it'll extrapolate the measurements of the other items. And that's all the cons consumer, I'm sorry, computer software that exists in these various programs we talked about. You don't necessarily know the algorithms or the, the math and physics behind it. You just know that it has been certified to work. Yes. And, um, this type of software, and we're talking about this concept of a motion suit, does that have application also in the entertainment industry? Yes. What type? The suit that I have, um, it was used in Avatar, Iron Man, X-Men, and they use it for creating uh, movements of the characters in the movies. 
and it also is used in games, gaming, uh, like Mad, Madsen uh, football. So they put on the suit and record the movements and apply them to the figures. So in effect, when we see Robert Downey Jr. running around looking like Iron Man, it's actually a stuntman in a motion suit? Or he could be wearing it. Oh, okay. And then the Iron Man has been placed on top of him in the movie? In the computer, in the 3D program. Okay. And um, we were talking, and I took you off on a bit of a path, we were talking about um, your experience in testifying. So you advised the court, I think you said about 2007 you testified about a case. Um, how many times have you testified in court where your animations were presented? And do you need your CV? Yeah. back to your CV. It seems to be close by, but not right here. Um, so if you could advise the court um, your experience in testifying regarding the animations. Um, animations or use of I'm, I'm the suit? Use of the suit and your presentations in court. Um, pretty much most of the work that I've done since I uh, acquired the suit in 2008. I'm sorry? Pretty much most of the cases that I've worked on since 2008. So probably uh, um, 20. Okay. And if you could um, advise the court the types of cases that you've worked on and what courts you presented them to. Um, that's also on my CV. Yeah. It's got a list of the counties and the Sure. Just having a bit of a trouble finding you right now. I don't know if you have a copy of it on your I think I got um, it on my iPad. Computer. Sorry? I might have it on my iPad. Uh, if you don't mind, if the court doesn't mind a moment for you to get that, and we'll present a copy of her hard copies. Mr. Manti, would you like to see it when he brings it up? I actually have a copy, so okay. I don't need to see one, but... It was provided. I just... Um, <laughs> Not suggesting anything, but when it wasn't a hearing, then it didn't know that I needed that information. Okay. Copy for the court of the deposition from last night. I got an electronic copy mailed to me. This is part three of the witness's deposition. And essentially what we have now done from the state's perspective is we have moved from the witness initially creating the exhibit that he said represented essentially the, the physical evidence as well as things he gathered from police reports and witness statements. Now what changed since the last portion of the deposition, which is what resulted in the production of the animation I received yesterday, is that we have now taken the animation and attempted to fit it to the theory of an expert who has yet to actually testify about it. Um, so we have now gone from, and, and that's the reason that the state now believes that there is now a Daubert issue, because we have now moved from simple representation as to physical items to now attempting to create a, essentially a, a animated, I don't know if you want to call it a cartoon, but an animated depiction of the theory that the uh, that Dr. DeMaio discussed. Good morning. Sorry, buddy. Late or too late. Sorry about that. It's okay. We're on the record case number 12 CF 1083A, State versus George Zimmerman. issue of the animation. We had a deposition last night that I think focused the inquiry a bit. I know that the state still has some concerns that they need to address. I don't think it's as much like we talked about yesterday as an admissibility problem itself as to the underlying science, but a question of the applicability to the facts. Actually, based upon 
the testimony i have supplemented the original motion again this morning and i now do believe that there is both concerns both the dahlberg sort of admissibility issue as well as the earlier concerns most of them that i had originally outlined the, the reason is this the gist and i do have a i hope wasn't necessary yesterday but given what was said last night i believe it is with this witness on the phone on Saturday after Mr. Shoemaker had been deposed twice, but right before Dr. DeMaio's deposition. Um, at least that's according to the timing that Mr. Shoemaker told us last night. So because of that, because of what came out in that deposition that I'm glad the court authorized last night, I do now think that we need to expand this hearing to include Daubert materials. And I do have some, some cases that point that out why, but whether we call it a Daubert or Fry hearing, a combination Daubert, Fry, Pierce hearing. I think that all those issues now need to get fleshed out based upon the reasons for this change and what they represent. And I filed a, a supplemental motion this morning accordingly. I would also point out during last night's deposition, the witness indicated that he had prepared additional still depictions and also it showed, showed me or displayed a, com a computer diagram um, indicated I was going to be getting copies of that. I got the court reporter's promised transcript, but I have gotten nothing yet from the witness. So I still don't have those physical things to hand to the court to show you. But that is the reason for the supplemental motion, and I apologize for now telling the court that we do want what I thought.